we're talking about alchemical studies. And so Jung, what Jung was doing here, and this was an early book, The Spirit Mercurius came out the first time in 1942. So it was three, for him, it was three years into World War II. And so he was trying to offer things kind of sub rosa, but trying to help people think about what it is we're all doing. And so this article is quite long. It's nearly 60 pages long. And I often say that Dr. Jung's, I mentioned his prodigious scholarship. And I think that the things that he was dredging up that nobody else wanted to talk or think about were different enough so that he felt that he had to put all the predicates all the way along. And so what he has done in many of his books is gone back to the beginnings of human thought and shown how things have developed right up to his day. In the case of the spirit Mercurius, what he's talking about is the spirit that makes anything happen. Okay, it's not, it's not one thing. It's not like a god. And it's really not Mercury or Hermes. It is the spirit that makes anything happen. And he goes through in this essay all the different ways of understanding Mercurius. And so in the summary again, which I read briefly last week, but I'll mention again, he highlights six main aspects of Mercurius. So number one, Mercurius consists of all conceivable opposites. He is thus quite obviously a duality, but is named a unity in spite of the fact that his innumerable inner contradictions can dramatically fly apart into an equal number of disparate and apparently independent figures. So first of all, the spirit is all opposites. And the point about that is that psychic energy comes from opposites. And this was one of the main things that uh, Dr. Jung talked about in his career. And just mention again this book, um, Psychic Energy by M. Esther Harding. Uh, Dr. Harding was a first generation follower of Dr. Jung. She visited him in Switzerland many times and participated in many of his long um, lecture series. And she wrote that this book was published in 1949. It's called Psychic Energy, Its Source and Its Transformation. And it's a brilliant book because it really tells you with an overview of what Dr. Jung's work was all about. And one of the key elements that it was about was psychic energy. So uh, Dr. Jung liked to use the metaphor of up to down and uh, the waterfall and saying how energy is produced by water going from the top down the waterfall to the bottom. And obviously you can generate electricity that way, among other things. But then the water goes back in a cycle and uh, condenses again and goes back up into the sky. So I don't know, whatever, I guess it's heat causes the water to evaporate and rise into the sky again. Then it falls back down and it comes back down over the waterfall once again. And so those are those opposites of energy production are exactly metaphorical of the energy production that happens in the psyche. So what Dr. Jung is saying here in the summary is that Mercurius represents all conceivable opposites. Number two, he's both material and spiritual. And um, 
as we'll get into it, I hope tonight, uh, Dr. Jung, when he's talking about the spirit being material, he's talking about the philosopher's stone being the matrix, okay, the matrix of uh, the solidified matrix, okay, and obviously the spiritual aspect is pretty clear, but Thomas says, I ran across a great book once called Alchemical Psychology by a guy named Tom Cavalli. Uh, old Recipes for Living in a New World was very helpful to me, Ray, technical alchemy terms and processing. Yeah, uh, Tom Cavalli is a well-known Jungian analyst, and uh, I know of the book. I haven't actually heard it, but there is also a a terrific, terrific either book or lecture by Hillman. It was a three-day uh, workshop he did on alchemy. And basically what he was talking about was, yeah, it's a, it's a book by James Hillman called The Alchemy of Psychology. And what he did in that, and I have it as an audio book, and what he did was go through all of alchemy and his audience was psychotherapists. So he was talking about all the alchemical procedures as they relate to psychotherapy. And so that's a, that's a very useful seminar that he ran. It was a three-day seminar, so there's about 10 hours of material there, maybe even more. And uh, it it gets pretty detailed, and, <laughs> but it's definitely worth going through at least once to understand. And Andy asks, has anyone read the Seven Sermons of the Dead? Well, anyone who's read the Red Book will have read the Seven Sermons of the Dead. That's an essential part of understanding Dr. Jung's visioning period. Let's say in the 30s and 40s, maybe the 50s, he kind of uh, regretted the publication of Seven Sermons of the Dead. He had written it as a, as a birthday gift for someone, and he had a small publication of it done, and somehow it managed to find its way out into the public domain. And what it is, is uh, a part of his visioning process. And because it happened in uh, 1915 and 1916, I believe, uh, it was obviously during a very emotional time for Europeans, and a, particularly for Swiss, because they were surrounded by this war for, um, you know, at least six years of active war, and, and before the active war, about a decade of very threatening times before the war broke out. I'm sorry, I'm thinking, I'm conflating World War II with World War I, but this was World War I, and so obviously Dr. Jung was very emotionally upset at that time, and that actually resulted in him discovering the collective unconscious because because he had those five visions of the beginning of the war before it actually broke out and that was actually how he realized the collective unconscious existed because he had experienced it himself but he said about seven sermons of the dead that that was a, a youthful indiscretion because when he when it got out into the public domain, he had a hard time explaining what it was to average people and justifying it to psychologists. It's, it's truly profound when you look at it now in the context of, in the fullness of time and looking at his uh, overall oeuvre. One of the most important things is, is one of the first sentences in the seven sermons, which is this crowd of ghosts knocks at his door and he opens the door and they say, uh, we have been to Jerusalem where we have not found what we sought. And 
the point is that we can all get on a jag where we don't find what we ultimately seek. The example I gave a, a few weeks ago was the 63-foot yacht with the name Never Enough, okay, which is sort of, I say that the, the marina outside my, uh, my building here is filled with monuments to the god of materialism because people think that they're going to find happiness, that if, if they only get to this point, if they only get the 63-foot yacht, then they'll be happy. But obviously that person wasn't happy because never enough was the name he put on his boat. And, and that's the, the same experience that the ghosts had at the beginning of Never Enough, or I'm sorry, of, of the first Sermon to the Dead, which was they had been to Jerusalem looking for some sort of spiritual enlightenment, and they did not find it. They did not get it. And one could also imagine that, you know, the Crusaders of the, of the uh, 10th, 11th, and 12th centuries must have had some idea that they would get closer to God if they only went to Jerusalem. They maintained the kingdom of Jerusalem for 200 years, and then they came back to Europe because they did not find what they sought there. So let me quickly get through these other um, four things that it is in the summary, and then I'll go and read that story because that's an important aspect of this. Okay, so number three, he is a process by which the lower and material is transformed into the higher and spiritual, and vice versa. Okay, so you can think of the, the process that makes the waterfall go. All right, he is the devil. Okay, so here's, here's what's really interesting. Number four, he is the devil, a redeeming psychopomp, an evasive trickster, and God's reflection in physical nature. So he's all these things. This, the spirit is all of these things. He is also, number five, he is also a reflection of a mystical experience of the artifacts that coincides with the Opus Alchemicum. So he's the mystical experience which the alchemists were uh, having for 1700 years while they did the, their work. And, um, you know, we, we're, we're going to have to talk about alchemy and, and mystical experiences another time. But uh, if you've ever had one, then you know, you have no need to believe, you know. So those experiences happen across the world. I was in, in Buddhism, they call them people who have had them, the self-sprung ones. <laughs> and at least that's the English translation for, from Tibetan Buddhism. It's actually a religious experience. And uh, I have several of mine uh, on this channel, which you can see for yourself. Mostly they're very hard to catch on video, but I've caught two on video and one of those is the experience with the Pollock, and I've caught one in still, still film, Breakthroughs to the Unconscious, my playlist called that, you'll find them. And so number six, as such, he re represents on the one hand the self, and on the other the individuation process, and because of the limitless number of his names, also the collective unconscious. So that last description basically makes the spirit anything. Okay. So we'll come back to the to the summary section. I want to I want to just read the opening little bit here uh, at the beginning of this because this is Dr. Jung's predicate for this essay and he's he's here quoting a magic papyrus uh, he doesn't date it, and I don't have a date offhand, but 
It's a description of Hermes, and it is in, it seems to be in Greek, and so this is the English translation of the Greek. Hermes, ruler of the world, dweller in the heart, circle of the moon, round and square, inventor of the words of the tongue, obedient to justice, wearer of the chlames, shod in winged sandals, guardian of the many sounding tongue, prophet to mortals. Okay, so that's a pretty all-purpose God. I, I call that the uh, Swiss Army knife of God. <laughs>